On October 10th, 2007, Soyuz TMA-11 launched atop a Soyuz FG launch vehicle from Bankanor Cosmodrome. Launch. Liftoff, liftoff of the Soyuz rocket and Expedition 16 to the International Space Station. Unintelligible. It brought to the station two members of the ISS Expedition 16 crew, Yuri Malenchenko and Peggy Whiston, as well as Sheikh Musafar, the first Malaysian in space. The Soyuz first stage delivering 102 tons of thrust from four boosters in a single engine. The first stage 68 feet long, 24 feet in diameter. The first stage burns for two minutes and six seconds. After the standard two-day rendezvous orbit, Soyuz TMA-11 docked to the nadir port of Zarya on October 12th 2007. After a week aboard the station conducting scientific experiments and performing a crew handoff ceremony, Expedition 15 crew members Oleg Katov and Fyodor Yurchikin, along with Musafar, entered Soyuz TMA-10 and undocked from the ISS on October 21st. During atmospheric re-entry, the spacecraft transitioned to a ballistic re-entry, a backup re-entry mode that takes over if something goes wrong. The result was a landing approximately 340 kilometers northwest of the intended site on the steppes of Kazakhstan. The trajectory was reported by the crew as soon as they came out of the communications blackout caused by plasma surrounding the spacecraft. A commission of inquiry determined that the ballistic re-entry was caused by damage to a cable in the spacecraft's control panel, which connected the control panel with the Soyuz descent equipment. The service module had failed to separate from the re-entry module, and the ship had entered the atmosphere with the opposite orientation. Explosive bolts and connection struts between the re-entry module and the service module had failed to explode. The heat of re-entry had melted the failed struts and the re-entry module had separated from the service module, which changed the directory of the ship and caused the switch to the ballistic emergency landing. The same situation had happened during the Soyuz 5 mission in 1969. The Soyuz re-entry module was, and still is, protected on all sides with thermal insulation, so the struts melted before the crew entry hatch was damaged or destroyed, thus saving the crew. On October 23, 2007, Space Shuttle Discovery launched STS-120, which carried the Harmony module to the International Space Station. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery, hoisting Harmony to the heavens and opening new gateways for international science. Discovery has cleared the tower. As commander of STS-120, Pamela Melroy became the second woman to command a space shuttle mission, while ISS Expedition 16 was commanded by Peggy Whiston, the first female ISS commander, thus making the first time two female mission commanders would be in space at the same time. Discovery seven miles downrange at an altitude of two statute miles. Flying at 600 miles per hour, Discovery's engines are throttling down as the orbiter passes through the area of maximum pressure on the vehicle. Now 50 seconds into the flight. Burnout and of the solid rocket 103, 103. Okay, so that was about 150,000 feet Mach 5. The solid rocket booster separated. We continued on on our three main Within engines. Everything worked great on ASA. It was wonderful. 
and then separated uh, from the tank after achieving our main engine cutoff. And uh, that was a look at last look at ET-120. It performed uh, wonderfully for us. And uh, we opened up the payload bay doors and got to work. After achieving orbit, the crew used the orbital boom sensor system to inspect the shuttle for any damage sustained during launch. And then it was also kind of fun. We saw at one point that uh, we could see ourselves in the window and of course had to, had to wave. <clears throat> so we gave ourselves an inspection. After the standard two-day rendezvous orbit, on October 25th, 2007, Discovery approached the station and performed the pitch-over maneuver to inspect the underside of the shuttle. They have uh, telephoto lenses and they can snap photographs of our TPS to make sure that no critical dings have uh, been sustained and uh, here we are uh, getting closer to station. Discovery then slowly approached and docked to PMA2. Um, and it's uh, pretty awe-inspiring to uh, kind of line yourself up, uh, but you can you can see that I'm actually not looking out the window. I'm uh, following the guidance of the cameras, and I'll bring you on board here for docking. Capture light. Discovery and Alpha capture confirmed. Discovery arriving. <laughs> But this is really the moment that's most exciting of all, is uh, the uh, ability to see your friends and the big hugs and the laughing that goes on when we get to see our friends, uh, particularly Clay, who we hadn't seen in many months. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time for that. we got to get ready for the spacewalks. On October 26th, the two crews conducted the mission's first spacewalk, with members Parazinski and Wheelock successfully completing all EVA activities including preparing Harmony for the removal from the shuttle payload bay. Wilson, Tani, and Anderson then controlled the station's robotic arm and moved Harmony out of the bay and to the port side of the Unity node, where it was officially mated to the space station. A temporary st station on the, on the node one. This is, of course, the f fast uh, forward. We don't go that fast with the, with the hardware. And... Um, so the, while all of this happen, is happening, uh, uh, of course, the spacewalk is still uh, ongoing. And uh, uh, in fact, at this point, we're concentrating on the P6, uh, removing uh, all the connection there, hydraulic connection, ammonia connection. They actually got sprayed. Scott got sprayed a little bit with ammonia. So we had to do a decontamination at the end of the spacewalk. The new addition increased the station's living volume by almost 20%. Harmony, also known as Node 2, is the utility hub of the International Space Station. It connects the laboratory modules of the United States, Europe, and Japan, as well as providing electrical power and electronic data. It also includes sleeping cabins for four of the six crew. Harmony is the second of three node modules in the United States orbital segment. It is composed of cylindrical aluminum alloy pressure shell with two end cones and is thermally insulated by a gold eyes Kapton blanket. It's protected from micrometeoroids by 98 panels, each with an aluminum alloy bumper primary barrier and a secondary barrier of Kevlar and resin. The design is based on the existing multi-purpose logistic module, as well as the European Space Agency's Columbus module. Harmony is managed by NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Its deployment expanded the space station, allowing it to grow from the size of a three-bedroom house to the space equivalent of a typical five-bedroom house, especially once the Japanese Kibo and European Columbus laboratories were attached. The space station robotic arm, Canadarm2, is able to operate from a powered grapple fixture on the exterior of Harmony, and Harmony is equipped with eight international standard payload racks, four for avionics and four for crew quarters. On October 28th, Parazinski and Tani conducted the second spacewalk, performing additional tasks outside the station, followed by a third spacewalk two days later, and a fourth on November 3rd, 2007. We'd gotten P6 detached at that point, and uh, it was time to attach it and put it in its final location at the uh, far port end of the truss, but there are no cameras out there. So the robotics operators got P6 all lined up, and then we sent uh, Scott and Wheels out there to essentially give uh, a visual uh, guidance 
to the operators, the robotics operators, to line the two up perfectly uh, so that P6 would uh, get attached to the station. And so once everything had been lined up using the robotic arm, uh, the spacewalkers used uh, their tools in order to actually fix the two of them together. So very uh, thrilling moment actually to get P6 anchored at the end. You can see how far out they are. That's the shuttle way out there. It's tremendously uh, far distance out at the end of that truss. Uh, we also delivered um, a new MBSU uh, main bus switching unit. And uh, at just as the EVA was wrapping up, we started to deploy the solar arrays. Now, we had a very high sun angle, uh, and that gave us a little bit of difficulties, but we got the first uh, solar array deployed without any difficulties. But uh, P6 has uh, one little bit of a cranky solar array that's given us trouble before, and uh, you can see how bad the lighting was. Uh, at one point, it came out of some glare, and this is what we saw. We were all just completely horrified to see it. Um, as I think I described it as a fur ball. So that kicked off some very intense activity for several days as we prepared to fix the solar array. And we had to actually construct the cufflinks, is what we called them. Uh, they're just basically load-bearing devices that you'll see Scott install onto the solar array. And it took a tremendous amount of effort for the ground and uh, the crew to prepare for this spacewalk. And uh, finally, it was time to go out the door. Yeah, the morning of uh, EVA 4, uh, music from Star Wars was sent up, so it really got us fired up for a very big day in space. Uh, uh, my wrists are being uh, covered here by three layers of uh, Kapton tape for a little extra insulation and protection. One for my daughter Jenna, one for Luke, and one for my wife uh, uh, Gail, so that, that made me feel better. Uh, we got on the end of this enormous boom, it was the space station robotic arm plus the OBSS, so about a 90 uh, foot uh, boom that uh, I'm perched on the end of here and I just was treated to a God's eye view. This is much prettier in color by the way, take my word on it. Uh, but I, I could see the entire space station and, and just a, a phenomenal uh, view on the on the way out. About 45 minutes out to the work site, uh, like uh, threading a needle, a very very difficult uh, robotics to get me out there. Uh, and at the very end of the trajectory, lo and behold, I was able to see the, the damage. Uh, which we hadn't been able to really visualize all that clearly from the uh, the cockpit. And it turned out to be a snag in a guide wire and one of the hinge wires that had ripped apart two of the uh, the hinges. And so I had to cut the uh, the offending snag out and then install these cufflinks. The first one went in very nicely here, as you'll see. But uh, as things progressed, I really wanted to have my buddy wheels out, out there on the end of the arm with me because I needed to have an extra set of hands. Um, we'll see in the next sequence here, you know, there's there's some waving motion of the uh, the array. I needed to push, pull, and install the uh, the cufflink all at the same time. So I ended up using three tools at once here, and uh, it worked out really nicely. That uh, extra tool there we called the hockey stick. That was my my second best friend out there at the uh, the work site. Wills is my best buddy, but. Uh, uh, and uh, we ended, ended up putting in uh, five uh, cufflinks across the br uh, breadth of the, uh, the solar array here, and you can actually see the, uh, the full repair at this point. We uh, stayed out for another half hour or so and monitored the, uh, the full deployment of the array, and uh, pleased to report that it's producing 100% power, taking loads on the space station, and I think it's really a, a triumph of the entire NASA team to be able to pull something like this off in just 72 hours of homework on the ground. A lot of sleepless nights for many, many people. Uh, at the end of the walk, uh, we kind of uh, cruised on back to the, the airlock, and it was really beautiful. I could just pull off with my fingertips and then coast for 20 or 30 feet. Uh, just a really uh, beautiful sensation. We were outside for seven hours and 19 minutes this day. After conducting a farewell ceremony, Discovery undocked from the ISS on November 5th, 2007. Then came uh, undock and, and separation. Uh, the undock happened about 10 seconds early, and uh, there's our separation. The springs from the, uh, the docking apparatus give us our initial push out away from the station, and we end up separating at a very stately rate of about one foot every 10 seconds. And Peggy uh, rang us out, as is now the tradition. That's my one input at 30 feet to double the rate to two feet every 10 seconds. <laughs> so a pretty spectacular view of the station as we were going out and and uh, curious lighting effect because there's no atmosphere or anything to dim the light the station is very starkly lit 
again we're missing a little bit of this because it's in the black and white but the station is very uh, very bright very radiant and then the earth tones beneath it are somewhat muted so it almost looks like it's it's fake like it's uh, uh, two fit pieces of uh, film put together but it is a beautiful thing and then uh, we uh, bade farewell to the station as the as the sun set on it and we did our final separation burn after two days in orbit Discovery landed at Kennedy Space Center on November 7, 2007. Here, of course, you can see uh, the uh, spectacular fireworks of entry. And uh, as we come down, we came over the uh, continental United States, and it was just unbelievable. It was like doing a supersonic low level. We just felt like the world was on fast forward, zooming past us. Uh, spectacular view and then of course it was a beautiful clear dry day here in Florida and uh, you can see a little bit in the heads-up display there the coast of uh, in Cocoa Beach there uh, beneath us as we came in um, just a, a really really pretty day I think to uh, to see the shuttle from a long way away there was one little tiny cloud deck right over the runway <laughs> but we we did break out at about 4,000 feet and uh, then of course uh, George put the gear down um, and uh, here we are touching back at the home of Discovery at the Kennedy Space Center. So that is a, a wonderful moment for us. Um, it is a, a heck of a long runway, but we're still going pretty fast. So of course we have to deploy a drag chute to help slow ourselves down. But uh, it's just, just an awesome thing. Five days after Discovery undocked, the Expedition 16 crew moved the pressurized mating adapter 2 from Destiny to the forward birth of Harmony. Two days later, on November 14, 2007, the combined PMA-2 Harmony unit was berthed to its final destination at the forward end of Destiny. Five months after docking to the station, Progress M61 undocked from the Pierce module on December 22, 2007. Following undocking, it conducted technological experiments and research as part of the Plasma Progress program for a month before it was deorbited on January 22, 2008 and burned up in the atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean. On December 23, 2007, Progress M62 was launched by a Soyuz U carrier rocket from Site 15 at Bankinor Cosmodrome. And there you see Progress lifting off from the Bankinor Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, in Kazakhstan on its way to the International Space Station for a docking to the piers docking compartment. After the standard two-day rendezvous orbit, Progress M62 docked with the Pierce module on December 26, 2007. Progress M62 remained docked for 40 days before undocking on February 4, 2008. Following undocking, it conducted Earth observation experiments for 10 days prior to being deorbited on February 15, 2008. The spacecraft burned up in the atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean. On February 5, 2008, Progress M63 launched on a Soyuz U carrier rocket from Site 15 at Bankinor Cosmodrome. Main engine ignition. Three, two, one. Turbo pumps up to flight speed. Maximum thrust and liftoff. Liftoff of the Progress resupply vehicle en route to the International Space Station. Structural parameters reported to be normal. Good roll, pitch and yaw program initiated. After the standard two-day rendezvous orbit, Progress M63 docked with the Pierce module on February 7, 2008. The building of the station would continue next with the addition of the Columbus module and the arrival of the European Space Agency cargo ship, the Automated Transfer Vehicle. 